Welcome to the Museum of Aquarium and Pet History. I am in the Mermaid Lounge, and today we're going to talk about someone who is, in my mind, pet industry royalty. And I think in a lot of people's mind, he's that way. His name is John Willinger, and he is of the Will Ness fame. So those of you that uh, are Metaframe fans, uh, Will Ness was the company that preceded Metaframe, and John worked for them for quite a few years, grew up with uh, Alan Willinger, that was his father, and, uh, and then he started his own company called uh, JW Pets. So um, I won't spoil it, but I'm really, really excited, and without further ado, let me introduce you to John Willinger. Well, I already shot the intro, John, so sorry. I had to tell him how, how wonderful you are. <laughs> I that. All right. Well, like I said in the beginning, you're kind of a royalty in the pet industry because your dad was Alan Willinger, who has like a hundred patents to his name and founded Willness, which really was the predecessor to all things Metaframe. And then you worked for those companies and then you started uh, JW Pets. But what I want to do is go back to the beginning, like when you were a kid, was your whole family into pets or was it your dad that got everybody into animals, you know, including well, I, I mean, we all got into it. It was, uh, especially I did. Um, yeah, I mean, I had everything. I had, I actually had a whole room full of reptiles before ZooMed existed, <laughs> many years before ZooMed Don't say that. existed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, yeah, I went, I, you know, I went through quite a quite a lot of uh, fish. I was I was into uh, you know this was really kind of pre saltwater days. I mean there wasn't much saltwater back then, um, but people were really into breeding. I think more than they are today, and that was uh, I got into especially bettas breeding, bettas or I know people call them betas today, but I I refuse to call them betas, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we got into uh, into into the Cambodian strain, which was uh, a lot of fun and and really interesting stuff. And how old were you? You know, re really young. I mean, uh, I I would say seven or eight, something like that. I can't remember how young because uh, I got into uh, music and tropical fish at a really young age, and. Uh, that was, uh, hard. I'm not really sure, but I remember when I was uh, fairly young, we had an 80 gallon tank, which in those days was really an unusual size, uh, that large a tank. And uh, I set that up, uh, or we set that up, my dad and I, and, uh, and then I had like three rows of five gallon tanks uh, that I used for breeding and reptiles and assorted other things. So um, it, the fish the fish tanks really dominated a you know relatively small bedroom basically um, that um, those were interesting interesting days. I mean the, the aquarium hobby was really different. I caught the end of um, a period that had really flourished in New York City. Um, Back in those days in New York City, um, different areas of the city specialized in different areas, different hobbies and different interests and so on. So, for example, uh, you know, photography, which I was also very involved in at what later, you know, uh, teenage years. Uh, Harold Square had like a slew of old and camera, all these names, which I, I would think do not exist anymore. And down in the... Um, uh, Wall Street area, or right above the Wall Street area, over where the um, the uh, uh, and Sock Company City Hall is, right around there, Nassau Street and Warren Street, all around what's today called Tribeca and so on. There were a whole bunch of um, aquarium shops. That's where they all were, and so there were some were already gone by the time I was um, very young. Um, and uh, but there were a few there. They were on Nassau Street. There was this tiny store called Nassau Street Pet Store, and um, you could buy like very young angel fish for like a quarter or something like that. The guy had it in, in the window of the of his 
store a fish tank with a sign on it that said it was a small fish tank with, you know, that black kind of frame that the old ones had. I don't look kind of marbleized or something. I'm not even sure what that was. It wasn't, I don't think it was metal. Um, that, but it said it was in continuous operation, that fish tank since like 1934 or something like that. And, uh, that 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 was an interesting story. The only problem is he sold the fish really young, and some didn't make it a little too young. But and then there was the Aquarium Stock Company, which was on Warren Street, and that was a solid block. And there was nothing like it in the United States, as far as I know. Maybe Los Angeles, I, I really don't know. Um, but they, that they had a big mail order business, and those catalogs. I wonder if anyone still has one. They were all illustrated. I mean, that was a different era when you know you could. I suppose, you know, because I went back to like the 30s and so on, um, when you could hire like really skilled illustrators to do a catalog like that. And that was a great catalog. And they did a big mail order business all across the country. So everything goes full circle, I suppose. And, uh, you know, now that's like in Tribeca and um, there's no aquarium stores there now, although not too, <laughs> there's some good ones, or at least one really good one in Chinatown, which is not that far away. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of change since then, you know. Is the Chinatown one still in business? Yeah, there's a really good, I mean, as, as far as I know, it was around maybe five years ago. And, and that, that, you know, is really, you know, possibly the best uh, aquarium store in Manhattan. It's a really wow. good, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a really good, good, good store. So I have a 1948, your dad and his brother started Wilness. Yeah, it might have even been before. We're, I'm not sure, you know, where did you get that date from? I'm curious to hear that. Uh, I don't remember. I read it somewhere. Because, so, you know, I mean, that, it, that's quite possible. I mean, uh, my... Uh, well, yeah, I guess that's right. I guess that date would make sense. They got out of the, uh, you know, World War II. They, the, uh, the, my uncle was uh, in the Army Air Force and my father was in the Navy. And they got out and I think they did go to college for a year or two because I heard my grandmother was in like absolute tears when they dropped out to do business full time. <laughs> um, so that I guess that date does make some sense because there was a there was a period a couple of years in college um, uh, before they they started uh, Wilness. Yeah, and it's yeah, um, it's interesting how they started it. Um, so you know I mentioned that the the aquarium shops in those days were all uh, scattered a little bit, a few blocks north of the financial district. And my grandfather was a telegraph operator. That makes me sound very old, which <laughs> maybe I am. I don't know. But I mean, it's like, you know, that's a long time ago. But, you know, telegraph was the thing. And um, he worked for uh, Western Union, sending telegrams and receiving telegrams and um, did the Morse code. And uh, so he worked very close to where all the aquarium shops were. And my father had been a hobbyist ever since he was um, very young. And, and, and he, was, um, he was a very serious hobbyist. It was, I, I, I have in mind, it was practically his whole life as a, as a, as a teenager and, and before that. Um, he um, grew up, they grew up in a, with six people in a one bedroom apartment in the Bronx. Those were large one bedroom apartments, but six people is a lot of people in a one bedroom apartment. Anyway, anyway, you look at it and they gave him a closet to put his fish tanks in. And uh, so he had this closet in that apartment with all these little fish tanks. And in those days, fish tanks were much smaller than they were today. I mean, a 10 gallon tank was, was uh, considered a significant size. So. Um, these were like three, four, five gallon tanks, and he had a whole bunch of them in this in this closet. And he was always, um, you know, technically uh, um, talented, um, to put it mildly, you know, really gifted. And he he started um, repairing heaters, and it became like a family business. My my grandfather would pick up broken heaters from these all those aquarium shops, which were a few blocks from where he worked on his way home. And they would, he would bring them up to the, to the apartment in the Bronx and they would repair them. 
and uh, and Alan, you know, taught everybody how to repair them. And I guess there was something where they had to like singe them and they had a fire escape so that the apartment didn't fill entirely with smoke and they would hold them by the <laughs> wires out, out the fire escape. So, so the, so the smoke would not, you know, totally inundate the, uh, the apartment. And, uh, and th this became, I mean, they were making more money doing this than my grandfather made as, as a telegraph operator, obviously, you know, telegraph operators were not, it wasn't a highly paid profession. So they were, they were, they were, they really started a nice little uh, business in there, and they would fix them on the kitchen table, and um, and and repair them. And they had this cousin named uh, Harold Nestler, and and Harold had some kind of little garment business of some sort, um, and he popped into the house you know in those days they didn't even have phones in their houses they used, they would just people would pop in you know relatives and you had no no warning he he popped in one day and uh um he saw they were fixing these heaters and he didn't know anything about it he didn't know what they were or anything he didn't know you know you know fish tank from an automobile but you know he he uh he he was already in, in some sort of a uh, small business. And he said to Alan, uh, could you make these? So Alan said, yeah, sure. So they started making them and they would go down uh, uh, Canal Street in New York. If, if uh, anyone has been there knows there's all these little shops. It's right on the edge of Chinatown. I mean, I guess, part, you know, the, the um, eastern part is, is part of Chinatown. And there were all these tiny stores selling these days like electronic parts. Um, in those days, they sold all kinds of little electrical parts, but so they would go down there, they would buy the t buy new test tubes, you know, with, for, for the heater, for the glass, they would buy all kinds of little things. And, um, and they started making heaters in, in, in the kitchen, the same kitchen they were repairing them, they started making them <laughs> and wrapping them in newspaper and selling them. And, uh, and that's really how well and you know this cousin harold nestler and harold's uh, younger brother i think he was younger i'm pretty sure he was younger brother herb nestler um the the four of them went into business um you know they really didn't know much about business they had very uh very little um real exposure to it they had some relatives i guess but uh, they were um so, you know, a lot of, you know, it's interesting that he had over a hundred patents, but many of the early things he did, he didn't know anything. He didn't know, I don't know if he knew what a patent was when he started in business. So <laughs> uh, one of the things he did was he saw pilot lights down there on uh, Canal Street and he thought, wow, maybe I could hook that into the heater so people will know when the heater turns on. And he never patented that or anything, but uh, that just, you know, was a connection he made looking at it. And um, so, you know, that was, and obviously, I don't know, I, I I would think every heater these days in the last 50 years has had a pilot light on it. So people know when it, when the heater is, is heating, but um, that was, that's was how it, how that happened, you know. So, so what your, your, your dad, Alan was the mad scientist inventor Right. What did what did his brother and the two uh, cousins you know do? you know uh, Harning was did I get I mean in the very early days he probably did most most everything else you know in terms of sales and uh, and and so on and so forth obviously the company grew and uh, you know, Harning was always you know the president of the company and ran it and did did the business side I mean Alan you know. You know, Alan had great, uh, great ideas, too. I mean, he knew the way the hobbyists thought. So which, you know, I don't not sure that I mean, I'm sure Harding developed that over time. But you know, that he was not a, a, an aquarium hobbyist himself or not, you know, not not serious one for sure. Um, and, uh, and what about uh, the uncles or the cousins? Yeah, they, they know they, they know no, none of them knew anything about about, about aquarium uh, any, anything of that sort you know um, so uh, over time Harold became sort of the the salesperson as as the thing grew Harold became uh, uh, the sales uh, and I don't want to get ahead of myself but also Irving Gall the later Irving Gall 
uh, they really handled the sales and Harding was, you know, the president of the company general and, and Alan was, um, you know, R and D and, you know, over the years developed, you know, quite a, quite a good staff of, you know, engineers and so on and so forth. How many employees did they have at their peak? Do you remember? Well, uh, you know, I mean, the pre if you're going ahead to Metaframe to like, you know, the Mattel, I mean, uh, well, you know, well over a thousand. It was a huge, you know, one of the things is that that has changed is, you know, they did not import until quite late anything. You know, they made everything. I mean, especially, you know, after they merged with Metaframe, they had this big, you know, I mean, that factory looked almost like an auto factory. I mean, they were bending metal. They were, you know, they had these guys who were, so, you know, uh, with blow torches and stuff, you know, soldering away. I mean, it, it was like heavy manufacturing and they made air pumps, they made everything. And they didn't, you know, so they, they started in the late forties. They did not import a single thing until well into the sixties and they fought it. They, 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 you know, they tried to fight imports and they, you know, put flags on their products and things like that to try to uh, induce some kind of um, loyalty on yeah. the basis of uh, keeping manufacturing here. And um, that it, it, it didn't work. So they ended up uh, in the mid 60s, mid to late 60s. Um, it's really just the last four or five years of the company uh, importing. I mean, and you know, that, that, and that became a big part of the operation. So, so in 61 is when, that's the date that I have, Will Ness. Yeah, that well. sounds correct. That, yeah, that's about correct. When Will, they, there was a three way merger, Will Ness, Growell, which is where Irving Gall came out of. And Metaframe, which was Metaframe was basically a fish tank ma manufacturer. They made fish tanks, which in those days with the with the metal um, bending and and all all that, it was that it was a um, it was quite an operation. It really was was something to to see that. And what about? Can you tell us anything about the Growell brand, uh, Irving well, Gall? Growell. I mean, they. You know, I I remember having some Growell products. I think they, you know they made remedies assorted. They had some filter, some just plastic. I don't know if they had any electromechanical products. Um, the only name that I think they was was not associated with them was an independent company, but that it was around in those days that made electromechanical products was Supreme. And I don't know if is Supreme still around today. I'm not even sure. It is run by the daughters, third generation, run by the daughters. Um, um, the two sons are still alive, I think, and the daughter, their daughters run it. But they just import. They don't make anything anymore. It's just oh, wow. imported. That, that's a shame. I mean, they used to make a really good heater. I mean, I I used their heaters for many years. I used the Aqua King and the Aqua Master. I thought their outside filters were great. Yeah, yeah. For big yeah. tanks, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so in well, let's see. Okay, 1969, Metaframe merged with Mattel. And your father and your father and uncle retired. Is that true? Uh, well uh just to backtrack so you know they merged in 61 um they went public soon thereafter and i'm not sure the year they went public i don't know do you have that information when they when when metaframe went public uh well it had to have been before 69 and that's oh, yeah, when no, it was well before that no it was in the early 60s early to me was, i'm gonna say it was like 63 when they went public and uh, it was it was a very successful um, uh, company. I mean, for people who invested a dollar at the time it went public, could have cashed out when Mattel acquired it for a hundred dollars. So you know, it was a they they did very well. Those were good years for the for the aquarium hobby. And they really, I mean, there there was a period there was no fish tank made in the United States other than the Metaframe aquariums. Um, it was, you know, it was capital intensive, it was labor intensive, right. and um, they were able to do it, to, to, to do it and do it really well. They, they, I mean, I knew a lot of people in the senior management. They had a brilliant engineer who passed away a couple of years ago named Eugene Blyweiss. The guy was an absolute fanatic. He was a friend of my father's, and um, this guy, 
he if he got lit literally if he got he went to city college in new york and at that time it was a very competitive uh place to go and you know all these brilliant people uh, from all different fields went there and this guy if he got less than an a he insisted on re <laughs> retaking the course it was free i think you know or, or, or if not free it was like really cheap and he really did a great job in terms of um the, the, that whole manufacturing operation and so they, they were they were very successful they sold it they went they went on the american stock exchange which in those days was a big thing you know since the high tech days of um going back to microsoft and apple the american uh, stock exchange really faded from view because you know the nasdaq became accepted and um and there was no um you know, the, it, it, there was no negative thoughts associated with the NASDAQ. I mean, it was viewed in, you know, back in those days as sort of almost like a penny stock exchange. It really wasn't, but that's how it was viewed. And that's what they went public on. But they did go on the American Stock Exchange at a certain point, which was a huge thing. Oh, I remember when that happened. Um, and um, but soon thereafter, they sold to Mattel and the Mattel people. Um, took it over and they the they um they stayed on for a while um they stayed on for i would say two years or so after two three years and um and then after uh, they they actually had litigated their non-compete and lost um and so they had to wait and they went in with will Enter brothers which i think they started about 1977 something like that so that so the sale to mattel was around 1970 something like that um is that what year what date do you have there 69 yeah 69 and they probably stayed there till 71 72 and then they had to wait it out <clears throat> a few years it went back into business in 76 with with will Enter brothers Hey, usually a covenant not to compete is five years. Yeah, so it makes makes about sense. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Um. So. Uh, okay, let's talk about Mattel. How long did they own a Metaframe? Well, they. I mean, oh, how long did Mattel? You know, they. You know, one. I want to mention one thing about the Mattel ownership. So they were there, and it may have been more than two years. It may have been as long as three. I'm not three or four. I'm not sure. But the one product that they did design, uh, that Allen did design and, and uh, had several patents on at Mattel was, was the Habit Trail, which was, you know, just an, an enormous success for Mattel. I mean, that... Uh, it's a brilliant uh, item. Any product, through a pet product through the years, other than, you know, maybe some dog foods, I mean, that became like a household word. You know, it was, it was known to, you know, people who never didn't even know what a hamster was or a gerbil was, you know, it, it really became a huge thing. And it was, you know, and, and if you think about it, it was an extremely innovative product. Um, the, uh, the idea of tubes and they really studied, um, you know, I think Mattel helped in some ways in terms of um, some of the R and D and stuff, but he had, so he had a group of really brilliant people there uh and i i want to and some some of the people in your audience may remember klaus waltman um who uh worked for him and he worked for me uh for for um for a number of years as well and he passed away uh sadly and he he was just uh an amazing person a person i am uh you know certain people in your life you're just happy that you knew them and you just observing them you just learned a lot about everything from uh from just being around them and, and klaus um uh just had a fat was a fascinating person had a fascinating life he grew up in nazi germany and uh he just was uh and had you know very interesting things to say and um kind of some tragic stuff but uh but he uh he he my father was when he developed the plastic plants he wanted to find a true hobbyist to to work with him on those that was uh, uh, you, you may know that, that was the first really realistic line of plastic plants before that people sold um terrestrial plants for you know imitations of terrestrial plants for aquariums and 
Alan came up with the idea of why not like develop a line that really looks like the plants that he kept as a kid and was, you know, so enamored with and knew so much about. Um, but it was it was a, a true labor of love, and he really wanted someone else who had that same kind of appreciation. So he, I think he, Klaus answered an ad. He was working at a, a prominent pet store uh, up in northern New Jersey, and you know they they really hit it off. And Alan saw that this guy you know knew fish and appreciated him the way he did. And he really helped a lot, and, and he helped me a lot too, in, in terms of even products that weren't in, uh, you know, I didn't do much in terms of aquarium products, uh, and was, which was just a stroke of luck in a sense, given what uh, was going on in those years. But, um, but Klaus helped with me with all kinds of products, uh, the bird products that we came out, which were JW Pet, which were very successful. He helped me um, with those. I mean, he really made major contributions, and uh, I wish he could be remembered as well. Okay, well, b before we get to JW Pets, tell me how Mattel sort of unraveled Metaframe because when well, I did you know, my Mattel, Mattel had had um, a major went through a major. Um, problem in those years it almost went bankrupt they really they were the there was a period there and then it was resurrected but um and some of the products they had you know you know all of us who've been through business and you know been involved in product development and so on you know inventory i mean the fundamentals man they'll they'll kill you i mean they they mattel they had products some of which became like the hot wheels you know really extremely successful but they just overbought into a recession and they really got, um, they, they almost went bankrupt. And so they went through a major reorganization and they sold off um, a slew of, you know, when, when Metaframe bought, uh, was sold to, Meta, to Mattel, at that time, Mattel, that, that whole period, conglomerates were, very, were like in vogue, uh, you know, in the 60s. Um, the thinking was, the way you put together a successful company is you try to match, you know, seasonality and cyclicality. So you have some companies that appeal to these, to certain sectors and not others. Um, but, you know, so you had these companies that were a total mishmash and Mattel became one of them. And um, uh, they, they basically sold them off during, during that whole period, all of them. Um, you know, that was the, you know, Tetra, always, people always wondered, how did Tetra become part of Warner Lambert? Well, that was during the 60s when, you know, that was the thing. Fortune 100 companies were going around buying all kinds of disparate uh, entities, which they knew um, very little about. And, and uh, Mattel was probably more of a connection than that. I mean, because, you know, they did deal the technic from a technical standpoint, they dealt with a lot of the same issues. You know, they were very, you know heavy into plastics and similar kinds of materials. I mean, we used and I used even myself even later engineers who had come out of out of Mattel. And you know, in the, in the toy field, you really got to be creative as an engineer in terms of uh, of all kinds of materials and all kinds of things that come at you. It's not that predictable. <clears throat> Okay, so one thing that I made a mistake on is when I did the uh, Dynaflow in my five-minute video, I mentioned that uh, Mattel had bankrupted Metaframe, which you said, you told, you corrected me in our phone call, and you said, no, that's not true, that uh, the Habit Trail was sold to Hagen, and right. the aquarium... Well, really, everything was sold to Hagen. Every, what, 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 so Metaframe sold the company to Aquology, which may, many of uh, the people who watch this may may remember, um, it, you know, and 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 I knew the the owner of Equology, and he and he was a very good guy. Uh, he really got over his head acquiring um, Metaframe, and uh, it was a bit uh, unwieldy and large for for his for him. Maybe the level of capitalization, I don't know. But in any event, um, he. Uh, he, he didn't make it. And uh, so the company, 
uh, it, it, he really, it really strung through a long time, longer than a lot of people probably would have expected, but he had a good staff. Um, uh, he had some very good people working for him. I, I don't know. Did you know any of those people, Gary, at, at Metaframe towards, the, towards those last years there? No, but I do remember Equology. I mean, we sold yeah. Metaframe. We sold lots of a Metaframe. And then all of a sudden, Equology came out of nowhere. And we, I remember selling their outside filters. Yeah. Um, but I, I think but my, I, my recollection is that Equology was the first to make those sort of heavy duty um, out, uh, under gravel filters. Like that was their, that was a big thing for them. They're under, that's my recollection. Does that sound right to you? No, Miracle. Miracle, uh, was really one of the earliest pioneers of the under gravel filter. And they came out like in the fifties. Yeah, no, no, but, the, but equalities were different. They were, they were heavier, like the Perfecto ones. Um, that's my recollection. They were the first ones to come up with those really solid ones. The mirror, I remember the Miracle ones. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I only remember Equality's outside filters, you know, which to me was a lot like the Supreme Aquamaster, you know. So it was but something happened with your lights. I can't see you right now. Sorry there you about go. that. That's better. Yeah. So, so wait, just just to clear this up because I'm a little confused. You said that Hagen bought Metaframe from Mattel, but then you said Equality no, bought. No, no, Equality bought Metaframe from Mattel. He, they didn't make. It went bankrupt eventually, and it, and the the, the assets were um sold at auction in federal federal court and um Hagen so basically what... bought the entire Pagan bought the entire um metaframe company he now he he decided not to use everything that they sold he you know he because obviously he had a very successful line some of the products which were really fading because uh you know M Mattel and then Equology did not really um, you know, put money into keeping keeping up, and the whole you know the synchronous motors that that are in you know the modern power filters. Um, uh, they didn't make that conversion, or they made them. I did think they had one, but they didn't really have the technology down. Where you know Hagen, you know he went to Italy and really worked with some real you know some very good companies there and stuck with them and still has, which is in my opinion is a smart move. But in any event, um, they, so Hagen decided not to continue using some of the uh, products uh, that were competitive and that he, they felt they didn't didn't really need. And they kept, you know, they kept the habit trail. They kept the plastic plants. I mean, that, those, those, that I think is the one, <laughs> I, I would bet that the only product that uh, Metaframe made Prior to the Mattel acquisition back in 1969, there is one group of products that I'll bet to you that is still in the market and still out there, and that is the 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 aquascapers, the the plastic plants. There may be others. I mean, you'd have to ask, you know, Ralph Jr. But uh, but I think that uh, that is definitely still around. So you know, some products really really last a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of incredible when you think about it. <laughs> so when did your father and his brother come out of retirement and start Second Nature? I think it was 76 or 77 when they hit the market. Um, at that time, they they were not, um, at the time, uh, our trade organization was called ATMA, which I'm sure you you, you and many of the people listening remember that. Um, and they had rules they could not exhibit until they had been in business a certain time. So they rented a, an off, a suite at a hotel across the street from the show. <laughs> and I'm not sure where the show was, but I think it might have been uh, in New York, possibly at the old uh, Americana Hotel. I'm not sure. But, uh, but in any event, they did that. And um, they, 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 their first product were the Whisper Air Pumps. And um, it, that product line was incredible. I mean, it took the market immediately. I mean, the, the, there was a hole in the market because of Metaframe's um, demise. They stopped shipping air pumps um, for whatever reason. So there was a big hole, and and they and they and they had a great product and a great marketing concept behind it, and they had really great sales reps. They did really everything right, and it really just 
it's one of those things where you, those situations where you start a company and there's like first day there's a line out the door. Well, people knew the people that knew your father knew how what a stickler he was for quality, and he went to Japan, not China, and he did a right. silicone flap. So he redesigned the guts yeah, of the airplane. Yeah, I'll tell you, all those stories about him are absolutely true. I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting because you know, in the last couple of years, I was teaching, and um, I was teaching on the university level, uh, and. Uh, I was teaching a course in entrepreneurship, and the and the um, one of the fads now in uh, the academic world and the entrepreneur, which is entrepreneurship, is becoming a big big field of study. Um, and one of the fads is this whole deal with minimal viable product and lean startups. And the idea behind this thing is when you start up, you start up, you you create the minimal. Uh, you try to satisfy the minimal need that you're addressing and you know, you don't have to perfect it and everything. I mean, it is like the polar opposite of Alan's thinking about the way you come out with products. I mean, <laughs> the, a, the stories and, you know, anyone who worked with them through the years, both at uh, Metaframe and going, I'm sure going back to Wilness as well. I mean, he took this stuff. I mean, he, he did not like coming out with products. He liked working on them, but coming out was like, you know, the anxiety level and the sleepless nights um, were, were very difficult for him. And he, you know, he, everything that could go wrong went through his mind and he had tried to address those things. And uh, that mentality, at least for the aquarium field, and I, I would think many others, it, it's kind of gone in terms of the uh, overall picture of things in America, unfortunately, I think. But I think it's um, if for the aquarium field it really worked. I mean, he, he, you know, I'm not he. Not every product he ever came out with was successful, uh, but everyone worked well. You know, every he, I, I never heard of a product that that he came out with that Wilness or Metaframe or Willinger Brothers that been that wasn't you know really goof proofed. And um, you know, he liked to try to just anticipate everything. A consumer could do that's wrong. He thought about the way dealers, you know, because he had been in this for so long. And, you know, they owned a pet store too for some years too, back in the 50s. And uh, so, you know, he tried to think about all the things, you know, the way the way it was sold, the way it was shipped, you know, just every single thing that you could deal with. And uh, I, I think you probably do the same thing, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a funny story. We were trying to make an automatic misting machine for reptiles. And, uh, of course, those kind of things you, you take over to China because you can't make it in the U.S. anymore. Right. And we couldn't get it to work. We spent five years on it, couldn't get the circuit board to work. Finally, we sent an engineer over there. He found a new circuit board company run by Europeans, European-owned circuit board company. Still mm -hmm. Chinese laborers, but European-owned, European technicians. It worked. It took us five years to figure that out that, you know, You've got to have a company over there that's managed by Taiwanese or Europeans or U.S. people, that kind of thing, if you're going to get something electronic that's somewhat high end. You know, otherwise, our joke is if it has a plug, don't go to China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, it's an interesting thing. Obviously, you know, under the right management, uh, they can make very complex products there, like the iPhone or whatever. But uh, Under the right management. Yeah. Right, right. You you hit the hammer on the nail. Yeah. So what was the name of your uh, dad's pet shop? Just so or family's pet shop? Just so I know, so I could look it up. You know, someday. you know, I I really don't know the answer to that. That's an interesting <laughs> question. I'm not sure. I, they, they always refer to it as Bauman's because, and maybe that was the name, but I think that was the name of the building it was in. But maybe <laughs> they was maybe it was called Bauman's. I'm not sure. It was interesting. I mean, it was up in Morningside Heights, uh, uh, which is near Columbia University in that area. Oh, okay. All and, right. Um, he it uh um it, it it they sold uh both aquarium and pet products but they also sold like uh um fishing tackle and hunting equipment because uh they wanted something that sold during the summer <laughs> <laughs> so he he got pretty knowledgeable about all that stuff too you know all right so why did your your 
dad and his brother finally decided to retire and they, they sold to Tetra? Yeah, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really like that. I mean, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing that happened there. And, you know, some things, sometimes uh, luck is, it can be quite important. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we weren't really thinking of selling. We felt, um, you know, obviously, I don't think it's any secret, right? The aquarium field is not uh, what it once was, right? I mean, it, it has, you know, been a long time since it peaked, I would say. I understand now it's doing quite well, but I don't know if it's, you know, uh, where it was in its peak form. Um, but, I COVID, COVID uh, helped it. I'm sorry? COVID helped you, the aquarium. Field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, COVID has changed a lot of things. And, and I, I think many of these things have changed are going to be around for a long time, uh, maybe very long. Nothing, nothing, is imperm nothing is permanent in this world. Yeah, that's true. But, um, but I think a lot of these changes uh, are, are, are going to be with us for quite some time. I totally agree. Um, <laughs> so Tetra. So, so Tetra came oh, yeah. So, so, you know, we thought, we had thought at that time that um, this is a, you know, why would we sell now? I mean, PetSmart and Petco were growing at that time like weeds. And I'm sure you remember that period quite well. I mean, the sales with those companies was just, you know, going through the roof. And it was the first time ever, and I remember them talking about this, that there was a national company that really sold uh, that really had real aquarium sections. It never occurred before. You know, of course, you know, back in the day, Grants and Woolworths had these small aquarium sections and then Walmart, but they, they were very tiny. I mean, you know, PetSmart and Petco, you know, ha had and, and still have, you know, these ex larger sections than many, many uh, pet stores. So um, we thought this was the beginning of a, just a huge breakthrough. And selling um, w was a big mistake, but, you know, Tetra made an offer that, you know, was hard to refuse. Uh, my uncle really wanted to retire, and my father, w I think, was ambivalent, but he felt that uh, it was the right thing to do, given the, given the scope of the offer. Um, so... But you did tell me one time at a trade show that your father was sad when he retired. Yeah, he didn't... Um, <laughs> He didn't do well in retirement. I would yeah, say. you I told mean, me. You know, it's a, you know, retirement retiring for people who are, uh, you know, Entrep entrepreneurs or right. even you know could be even for it could be anyone. I mean, it could be a teacher, it could be anyone whose you know identity and such is you know wrapped up in in what they're doing. It, it creates a vacuum, and uh, some people do great. My uncle did great. And I've been very happy, but. Not everyone does, and we know, you know, you, you and I know, I don't, I don't know if it's, that's a subject we want to go into, but you and I know other people who really uh, failed, if one could say, as in retirement, you know. So growing up, when you were younger, you worked for Wilness? Was it around? Or did I didn't you work for them, no. I, 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 I never worked for them. I used to go there both in the early days. They had a building in the Bronx. I think that building... There's been some development along the uh, waterfront area in the Bronx, and I think that 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 factory is uh, was demolished uh, in the last five six years. But when I was young, they, they had this um, this factory in the Bronx, one of these multi you know old multi story type factories. Uh, yeah, you know, it's probably built you know I don't know. 1930 it could have been, it could have been it was probably pre-war because we're talking like the fit, late 50s early 60s yeah, and then when, you know, when they condos, when they yeah. merged and went public they 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 moved to maywood new jersey and had a had a building um uh that they put up in maywood new jersey that building is still there now that but it is not really suitable any longer in our in in you know the new york metro for manufacturing because this this or, or even um distribution because the ceiling you know that was a different age i mean the ceiling height was too low really for uh current you know modern distribution but that building was built about 1963 so i used you know i both those buildings i spent time there um, but I never worked there. I, I didn't really work with them until um, <clears throat> 1983, I, you know, once um, 
that at that point in 83 they really wanted to slow down and they i was practicing law so they wanted me to to run it so okay I did so what made you decide to start jw pets then you know it's interesting so you know i sold we, we sold the we sold uh to mattel and um you know, I, I was thinking about doing a lot of different things, but, you know, I don't know, the pet industry was like a magnet, you know, that you can't leave, right? <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was only 40 when, when we sold uh, Willinger Brothers, and uh, I, I, I had practiced law for a few years before, um, before Alan and Harding um, hired me uh, to run it, and... Um, and and that you know we, that Willinger brothers that was a great experience. I mean that that, that it was probably the best years ever for the aquarium field, and the company just had a really strong brand, and um, was and and between you know I learned a tremendous amount from both from both of them, uh, both Alan and Harding, uh, and um, it, it just you know it just skyrocketed. It's really amazing how the what you know, what happened in those years. Um, it, it was, a, it was, a, it was, you know, it was an exciting time to be in business. And, um, but, you know, we got the offer from, from Warner Lambert, from Tetra, and we did that. And I stayed there uh, about a year. Um, I had some disagreements. I don't know if we should really go into that, uh, <laughs> but I no. had some disagreements with, uh, uh, some of the management there and some of the significant things that they did um, and ended up leaving um, after about, I don't know, a year, year and a half. And um, so, I don't know, I was thinking about doing a lot of different things. I taught back then for a little while, too, at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, but I ended up, the, the pet industry just drew, drew me back. I had a non-compete. So I went into dog and cat, everything, but, uh, well, I didn't go into reptile. I didn't want to compete with you, Gary. <laughs> God bless but, you, John. <laughs> but, I, I, but, you know, I went, I, but it was basically dog and cat. We came out with some, uh, and, and, and actually we did a fair amount in bird, but, you know, the, the, we did come out with some aquarium products, but that was really because um, for distribution reasons, you know, when when the Hagen company decided not to sell through dis distribution, um, it left a void for a lot of a lot of major distributors. And they asked us to come out with um, some aquarium products, which which we did. It was uh, wasn't really the focus of the company, to be honest. But I, actually, I think some of the products are pretty good. We had some pretty unique things we came out with, but um, but it wasn't really the focus of the company. I always wondered why you didn't come out with fish products. Now it makes total sense. You had a covenant not to compete for a few years. And non-compete. And so we did dog products. And, you know, that, you know, obvious, you know, that, again, that was really a stroke of luck also because, you know, aquarium products be, we did not have the growth any longer that they had back in the, uh, in the days. And, and the dog, obviously, ever since then has just, you know, it's been nonstop, you know, uh, growth um that end of the business so that, that that was just you know that was a lucky thing to to get in there at that time and uh you know i was fortunate because you know i learned a lot from uh mostly from alan but you know from harning too and from klaus waltman you know from a lot of people um about product development product design um no one really, with the exception of the Kong company, not too many people had really focused like that in the in the dog area. So, uh, you know, it was a good time to come at, to to, you know, start coming up with new ideas for new designs and new kinds of products in in the field, the, the, you know, ones that were, you know, hopefully patentable and many, many of them were. So th that was, uh, you know, that was a good that was a good thing uh, that a good a good thing to have that non-compete it turned out i mean i wasn't happy about about it at the time <laughs> but it is actually you know a kind of a fortuitous um situation well you know i was always impressed and because when you did like brushes and all the utility dog grooming items you didn't just go to china and buy something off the shelf you created your own 
idea and design. Yeah, I mean, you know, this really was my father's method. You know, we like I start out with an idea. I mean, the, like those brushes, you know, no one, I mean, and, and it may be shocking in retrospect, but, you know, every, you know as you probably know, every invention is shot is um, seems normal, but, uh, you know, or, or shocking in retrospect that no one thought of it before. But, you know, and, and even the most complex ones, when oftentimes when you really get down and look at it there's some simple idea that it's sort of like resting on and um but no in the pet field no one had done ergonomic rubber handles for grooming tools and it's you know it's it's a really um terrific application of of the concept and so you know i just started working on it and i uh doing research on the um thermoplastic elastomer area and um you know i i found uh um some uh, a design firm that had done a lot of work with uh, ergonomic um design that they had done some you know toothbrushes and things for some well-known companies things of that nature nothing they might have done regular brushes too i forget but they but you know that's you know that that that, that was sort of the the idea the idea behind it now we won't mention any names but you had one of your big customers decide to kind of knock you off. You know, they went, they had their private label division and they went to China, they took your stuff, knocked you off. And, it, you know, it's tough when those situations because they're one of your bigger customers, right? So what do you do? Do you threaten to sue them or do you just, you know, turn a blind eye to it, you know? Yeah. In your case, you threatened to sue them. And it was, it turned out to be a great thing, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to say the intellectual property thing, um, it, it really, it has to be respected and and you know i i don't i can't really give people advice but uh on this subject because i understand the difficulty but you know also uh i mean i just see this all over and and i i really feel that creativity um has to be respected it's it, it you know without you know the this country i mean it was built on creativity. I mean, and the people's wealth was built on the creative work of, you know, Edison, Ford, you know, whoever, Alexander Graham Bell. And so, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, so I think it's really important that these patents uh, become, you know, that whole system is enforced as well as copyrights. And, you know, my, my, my main hobby in, in, in life has always been music and, you know, people are just you know music now it's it's free people don't expect to have to pay for it um the, the whole environment um uh, really has to change i think you know the the like creativity just has to be respected and and people have to make a living um from their creativity so this is uh this is a big issue Boy, that's a big conversation because, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. when you see those free, uh, you know, sites that you can listen to music on and, and the musicians that do those songs get pennies, maybe, maybe yeah. a penny. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've make seen people post on, on, uh, on Facebook and so on, you know, their receipts from, you know, some of these, uh, streaming services is like 50 cents, <laughs> I mean, you know, or, you know, five bucks. <laughs> 30 cents. I mean, you know, they used to make more than that from a couple selling a couple CDs. So, you know, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a big issue. I mean, it, you know, I just feel like, you know, creativity is the lifeblood of the, of any society, both, you know, in terms of business, in terms of arts, in terms of everything. And uh, right now, you know, the corporate environment is such that it's very difficult, you know, very difficult. I agree. Well, I just want to say about JW, um, I bought a bunch of your bird toys online recently to have them in the museum because I was just blown away. The, uh, what is it, Pekka Mule, Strong Bird, and Shooting Gallery. <laughs> I love these things. Oh, my God. Yeah. You, you guys really had fun making these bird toys. And yeah, and line. I tell you, Klaus Waltman, I mean, he was... I, I, I could not have done it without him. I, you know, most of the ideas were mine, but just to, in terms of figuring out how to do them and do them right, I mean, he really was They're brilliant. a brilliant uh, partner in that in that um, in that undertaking. 
I've never seen bird toys like this. You guys, kudos, man, that's incredible. And then what about this fusion pump? Did you go to Japan for that too? For which? For the fusion pump that you oh, guys did? Yeah, no, I did not. I did not go to Japan, no. no. All right, I was just curious. Yeah. All right, so then yeah, you saw- yeah, I have to say, you know, one thing that I am gratified is that um, it's been now over 10 years since I sold it. And the product is almost everywhere. I mean, I, you know, it's uh, it's all over the internet. The uh, all, you know, the the the, the uh, dog and cat product, and especially the dog product and the uh, bird stuff. It's it has really stood the test of time, which um, you know, it's it's quite gratifying. I, I think um, I, I'm sad that uh, the whisper stuff has has really not um and it's really in my opinion solely because it was mishandled by some of the uh, not and and, uh, and not hagen hagen did did a you know if anything has done a great job but um but before hagen um un unfortunately it was it was mishandled and um well, look at the Silent Giant. I mean, it was the leading air pump in the 1960s, and then it gets bought out, and they send it to Mexico. Right. And it was it was ruined. It was never the same. They lasted maybe one or two years, and then they were gone, off yeah. the market. You know, you can you know, the, the thing people don't realize the, these electromechanical aquarium products. They're unusual in, in the sense they're not the most complex products, granted. But there's high demands put on those products, very high demands. What are, you can't name that many products that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week forever. I mean, or for years, you know, without stopping. I mean, that's think about if you think about it, there's not that many products that run all the time and are supposed to be quiet. So there's a lot of demands on those products. And, you know, in general, at, at prices that are not, you know, that not, not very high. So it, it really creates um, a lot of issues. And um, so engineers look at the product and they'll say, oh, this is simple, but making them so that they're, you know, that they're robust and they're going to and, and they're going to be quiet and, and last, you know, it, it, it's not an easy thing. So you can move. You could have moved the Silent Giant to Mexico, but it's a major project, and people don't uh, understand. I mean, that you know. In, in addition, <laughs> as long as I'm up on my high ho holy horse here, I might as well go on. <laughs> you know, in addition to denigrating creativity, there, I, there's also, I think, a failure to understand um, manufacturing and how difficult manufacturing it is manufacturing is it is not easy you can move the product to mexico you can move it, these products to china but if you want a certain level of quality you better really take your time and do it step by step and really carefully and 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 then you can do it but you know people don't really uh understand uh i don't believe the complexity the difficulty you know a lot of the people involved in manufacturing who are really important don't have college degrees that doesn't mean that they don't know a lot they know a lot i mean you know we you know in the plastics field we worked with uh, uh master tool and die makers it takes 12 years of an apprenticeship to become a master tool and die maker and without those guys you don't have a plastics business i don't care what kind of machinery or computers or whatever you have so i think that you know there, there has to be a, a reevaluation of all that you know it's uh it's um it's a sad thing and uh and and i'm of the opinion it's important for uh, you know our country to do a lot of do a fair amount of manufacturing i think it's important so i wish it would come back i really do um there's got to be some changes made before it comes back i mean yeah uh, the no, taxes no. well look listen i mean i i don't know this your audience isn't going to want to hear about this <laughs> but i think you know the currency is a really important factor there's no way it's being a, the reserve currency is a double-edged sword it's there's no way we could sustain this if we were like every other country and had to maintain a balance of payments but whatever I, I agree subject.
I agree. So how long did you have JW Pets before you sold it? How many years? Uh, I think about 15. I started it in uh, 96 and okay. we sold it or 97 like that. And we sold it 2012. Yeah. So it was like 15 years. Okay. You have any regrets? Not really. No, I, um, I've been there. I have a lot of interests in, in, in life and, uh, I, you know, the, I found owning and running a company, uh, all consuming. And, <laughs> uh, so, um, so you don't think you'll come back into the pet industry someday? No, <laughs> I, um, uh, you know, I, I read an interview a while back with Ted Turner, who, you know, sold, uh, CNN and his, his empire. And, uh, they asked him about that, and he said, I don't know, 35 years of running companies is enough. <laughs> I, it was just about the same number of years I did it. So that, was, uh, that, was, that was enough. I mean, you know. Well, you could do like me. You can come to work every day, pretend like you're working, and just do your hobby, which is like making these <laughs> wonderful videos all about the history of the hobby, you know? I'm yeah. happier than I've ever yeah. been. This yeah. is the best yeah. thing I, I've ever you know, done. I, think, I love it. You know, you have a... Uh, an ability which I admire tremendously, and I wish I was like that to, you know, step back. And I never could do that. I don't think um, I was just I don't know, whatever. And I don't mean just physically in terms of what I was doing, but mentally in terms of what I was thinking about. So. <laughs> Well, John, this is probably going to be one of our longer videos, but I think it's a, one of the best videos we've done because you just have so much information that was so rapid fire and all the old timers are going to be so excited and be absorbing this and they're probably going to play it again two or three times because they Yeah, I mean, if anyone has any what, questions, you know, so, just, you know, feel free, you know, maybe if they send you guys the email, you can forward it to me. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll I feel, it over you know, you. I, I enjoyed very much talking about this and, and, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the things I feel is that, uh, Alan and Harning really built the, you know, and they, there were other people, I mean, Herb Axelrod with all, <laughs> all the things one may say about him <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were a few other people, Ralph Hagen definitely made a major contributions. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. Keith Bonner out west there made major contributions. Anton Schmidt. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of people. A lot of those distributors did did great things. And um, you know, it, it's it, 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 it's a lot of people. But they really were spearheading. I mean, the MetaFrame thing. They really built not just a company, but they really built an, a mass industry. And um, I, you know, I think it should be remembered. And, you know, obviously I'm not an objective uh, person on this, but they really built uh, built an industry. And, you know, the stories of how they started, uh, Alan was not that involved in this, but Harold Nessler, uh, my cousin, and um, who lived till 99, uh, and, and Harning um, were very involved in the early days of the pet industries organizations and starting it. And, you know, along with, um, you know, Mark Stern's father and Adrian Sokoloff and um, the, the Hirschberg um, grandparents, you know, they, they, they started it. Um, and some of the distributors like Pete Peterson and um, uh, uh, Joe Hanningman, you know, they were, they were around too. So, I mean, but they were part of the whole formation of the industry, but that will, but I think more than almost any single um element i think what what metaframe did was really something and, and you know every i i believe that almost every product you see in an aquarium traces to one of uh alan's alan's uh ideas and inventions so i i would hope that people remember it so i really appreciate what what you're doing and i hope also that your audience while I'm on the subject is uh, appreciates you and what you've done because you've done the same thing in the in the reptile field. I mean, you've really taken something that, you know, there weren't that many products and what was out there was disparate. There was no structure to any, you know, and you've really, uh, you know, been instrumental in building that whole that whole area. And it's uh, my hats off to you. I'll send you that 20 <laughs> bucks later.
No, I, no, I, wa- I wanted to say <laughs> that because I I, I, I I really feel that uh, you've done a tremendous job. No, I really appreciate that. So do you have any closing thoughts? Any fond memories? No, Anything I mean, it's a great in industry. I says- think, you know, it, it's unrecognizable. When I started uh, working there, which was uh, in uh, May of uh, 1983, I mean, it was like a family business. Uh, there were, you know, there wasn't, weren't that many, there were a few large companies that had, um, manufacturing entities in the field. Uh, it was, but it was really like a family business. I mean, it, it wasn't that much long before Harold Nessler and, and, um, Irving Gall, when they traveled, they would sleep in like the garage or the bedroom or the attic of their distributors, you know, and they would just drive around the Midwest and the South and so on and do that. And they were like family, they were really family businesses. And, uh, you know, we used to have those open houses and, you know, in the Northeast, you know, you'd go to the distributor and eat, you know, lasagna and pizza. And then, you know, you'd go down South and you'd have, you know, barbecue and stuff. I mean, it was, it was really a great thing. Um, and you know, the first thing that changed it was, you know, Petco and PetSmart coming out really changed it and that, and then, you know, the internet, but it's, it's, it's now, you know, I mean, the, the trade shows must be, I don't know, 20, 30 times what, what ours were back then. It was, it's, it's really, it's, it's an amazing thing that has happened through the years. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that I was a part, my family was a part of it. It's just it's just an interesting thing. I found it wasn't as much fun personally as it got more and more corporate and larger, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment that, you know, everyone in the industry who, um, has been there through the years partake has partaken in, you know, it's, it's amazing. Well, John, I can't, I, I'm overwhelmed and I can't thank you enough for, for coming and talking to everybody. Um, I'm sure that we'll talk again, and uh, um, I don't know what to say. It's kind of a, it's mind-boggling because Metaframe is so iconic. Willness, which a lot of people have forgotten about, is iconic. And uh, JW Pet, you should be very proud. I mean, it was a great company. A great opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are people interested in, and you know, who would remember, um, particularly what my father had done. Uh, it's growing. It's actually growing. There's even yeah. a Metaframe group, yeah, a collector's group, I, I mean, which I, I is just amazing. When I me. meet someone who remembers Willness, that's unusual, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have one of your dad's wow. old heaters here, right here. <laughs> a double wow. tube. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't. You know, I know we should really end this now, but the the that eighty gallon tank I had when I was a kid. Did you ever see? It had a separate thermostat from the heater and the heat the heater was looked like a crowbar like uh you know it was, it was this big iron or metal thing i don't know it was incredible it's some were heating rods and some were sand filled glass tubes they'd have the heating element in a sand filled glass tube and they'd have the right, thermostat right. you know outside yeah, the tank and, it was really, and they it was just really plug that in and uh and my father used to talk about the um aquarium products he had as a kid and I mean, some of them were, you know, just like practically homemade devices. But you know, it was, it was interesting. Um, there, there was an air pump they used that <laughs> that uh, was kind of kind of a homemade device. But I think they bought it. And I'm not going to tell you the name because it's sort of I, I don't know the name of the company, but the the name of the of the air pump was it's sort of an off color name, but. Um, the weird thing was that Klaus in Germany used the same exact thing. So it was, uh, it, it, it was, it was, it was very interesting, the stuff that they came up with. And, you know, those guys, they used to go to the, to the parks in the city to collect Daphne after, after a rain and things like that. It's amazing what they did. Yeah, that's great. All right. All right, John. Well, this will this will be a record record length. So I hope I get people to stay the Good. whole time. Well, but thanks I think a lot. Will. I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming out, and uh, I'm Good. sure we'll talk again soon. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Good night, thanks. John. Take care.